which is, of course, about uh, caring for paper collections. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our agenda. Um, here are the topics I'm hoping to get through today. We have a lot to cover, not very much time, so hopefully I will be able to get through it all. Um, feel free to ask questions as they pop up to you. You can go ahead and type them over in the chat box where you see everybody typing. Um, if you look on the top, it says Files 2. There's a couple of handouts up there, so you can just highlight them and push Upload File to get access to those files. Um, so we'll be referencing those throughout the, the webinar, so you might want to download them to have them handy. But first off, um, what is paper? Let's get started with what the actual material is that we're going to be talking about today. So um, paper generally refers to flat as, a, as opposed to bound paper materials, including documents, manuscripts, drawings, prints, posters, maps. Um, most of it consists of cellulosic uh, materials. It's a variety of plants that can serve um, as sources of cellulose for paper making, which in addition to hard and softwood, can include linen, hemp, cotton, and mulberry. Um, you may have also heard of cotton rag paper. It's another, another type of paper there. Um, the invention of hand, make, hand paper making is credited to the Chinese in about 105 AD, and the technique uh, gradually spread kind of across Europe, or across Asia, and then into Europe, becoming really popular in Europe around the 12th century. And in this hand-making process, which you see a photo of there, uh, a fibrous material such as cotton or wood pulp is boiled and pressed, so it's sort of this watery slurry, and then a screen called a mold is passed under the pulp to form um, mat, a mat of the fibers, and the resulting is a, is a sheet of interwined fibers pressed between felt sheets to be dried. Um, that sheet is then sized to make the surface suitable for writing, and that sizing can be uh, coating by either hand dipping, uh, either kind of hand painting or dipping into a tub of sizing solution. Um, the paper making machine um, was invented in France in the late 18th century. Um, this is what we're more familiar with today, uh, but it became really popular in England in about the 19th century. In machine paper making, that fibrous pulp of either wood or rags is suspended in water, which is placed in a reservoir. The pulp is poured into a continuous roll of woven wire mesh that allows the wire, water to drain through. The wire mesh is moved from side to side to, to form a mat of fibers again, and then the sheet runs through a felt roller to dry it. So this method has kind of, you know, been refined over the past, uh, you know, 200 plus years, but it's essentially the same process today. That's the process where, where we get paper. Um, so, you know, why do we kind of care about all of that, how paper is made, right? Um, well, because of what paper is made of and how it is made, it carries something called inherent vice. So basically, because of the materials the paper is made of and the process, it's prone to deterioration. Um, lignin is a great example of this inherent vice. This is a substance that occurs naturally within wood, and it is just acidic by nature. That's, that's what it is. Um, there are ways to make paper without lignin, such as doing treatments or using cotton rags instead of, of wood, um, but those methods are not as cheap or as efficient as um, is often needed in this process. Um, other inherent vice issues exist with paper as well. Over time, there were, you know, manufacturer modifications done to the process to make paper, you know, easier, cheaper to create. Um, sizing makes a paper surface more suitable for writing. Um, and after about 1650, alum was added to the tub of gelatin sizing to harden and keep it from spoiling. And, you know, that helped helped to, to uh, make paper more available, but it is extremely acidic and leads to acid hydrolysis of paper. So while the paper won't spoil, it now has problems with acid. Um, in about 1680, a mechanical device called the Hollander Beater was developed to chop up um, textile rags to be made into paper. And this resulted in weaker paper with shorter fib fibers. It also left residual metal particles in the paper, which can oxidize and, and cause, a, cause all sorts of problems. 
Um, another damaging process began in the 18th century when chlorine bleaching was introduced as a method of paper whitening. Um, and, you know, makes paper very white, but unfortunately the bleaching process uh, is very harmful um, to paper, forms um, hydrochloric acid within the sheets, and that, of course, dramatically shortens the lifespan of the paper. So while the quality of the paper has really uh, gone down, the, you know, ability to mass produce it has really gone up with a lot of these inventions. So um, there's sort of a trade-off there. Um, most papers produced from the mid-19th century to the present become brittle in about 25 to 50 years. Um, and surveys done actually in the 80s show that yellowing and brittleness are present in about 25 to 40% of research library collections. So these are definitely problems we all have. Um, understanding that, that there is some inherent vice um, with, with paper, let's go ahead and talk about some of the more common condition and issues that we see in paper. Um, as I said, many of these will be caused from inherent vice. I'll try to point those out. But others are caused from poor handling, poor environmental conditions, and some other regions, reasons as well. So after we talk about these condition issues um, and what they look like, learn how to recognize them, we'll talk a little bit about what we can avoid with them. Um, so this list that I'm about to go through at rapid pace is by no means comprehensive. Um, the websites I've listed here are where I took many of the images from. So if you're you know, wanting to go back and look, check out these websites. Um, it's good to kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with condition issues um, and their causes so that you can figure out what's going on with your collection, why certain issues are happening, and figure out ways to prevent them. So as I said, this is going to be kind of a rapid fire condition. So um, we're recording the webinar, so you can go back and listen to it if you need to. Um, but going alphabetically, the first term is abrasion. So abrasion happens when something rubs on something else. Um, it changes part of the surface by scraping, rubbing, um, perhaps over cleaning if a, you know someone's trying to clean something and don't really know how. Um, so that exposes the underlying layer. This is often the result of you know repeated friction, contact with other surfaces. Uh, you see it often around frames when things are directly against a frame, it'll abrade. What's what's beneath it? Um, next up is accretion. Accretion is really sort of a, just a fancy word for dirt. Um, the textbook definition is an accidental deposit of foreign material that was not part of the creation process. So common examples of accretions are dried liquid residue, maybe there's a splash or something nearby, um, airborne soot or dirt, dust, um, fly specks, uh, interior pollutants often are causes of accretions. Um, this is a big one because of paper's inherent vice, as I talked about, it's really susceptible to lots of acid issues. So to reiterate what I said in the beginning, trees contain lignin, that's a, a binding polymer that holds wood together, and acid is a byproduct of the breakdown of the lignin. So therefore, anything that has wood in it is potentially acidic. Really nice paper, as I said, has often been neutralized to take out some of the lignin, cotton rag paper would not have lignin in it because it's it's not made of wood. Um, but even if really nice paper is in contact with not so nice paper, like in its frame, framing or housing materials, there could be transfer of acidic substances between the two. So a lot of regular mat board is made of wood pulp and has lignin in it. Foam board is really potentially acidic. Frames are usually made of wood and those are potentially acidic as well. Um, so this will cause, cause kind of localized staining and discoloration like you see in um, these photos. The darkening usually resembles uh, burned paper. So you are often, you hear this is burn, matte burn, acid burn. Um, so here we see on this example, there's it's both on the front and the back of the artifact. So important to look at both sides to see if this is happening. Um, Buckling, there's a ton of terms actually for buckling, really all of them are fine. You might have heard cleavage, cupping, lifting, tenting, I have a bunch listed there. Basically what this is is a separation between layers. So this is if uh, you have painting or other media on top of a piece of paper. Um, that can result in flaking, the media lifts off. Um, 
often uh, it's caused by compression of the media layer. So this often happens if there's shrinkage going on and shrinkage occurs if there's low humidity. So having good control over your environment would really help on that. Cockling is distinct from buckling. Um, it's more sort of like rolling hills as opposed to those sharper ridges. And it's not the same um, you know, separation of, of the media layer. It's more a deformation in the, the paper itself. Um, but it is caused by some of the same factors, issues with relative humidity, um, namely. So again, same sort of thing you can avoid by controlling the temperature in RH. Embrittlement is a result of improper environmental conditions, including too much light, which, has, um, which will make chemical components in paper degrade. Uh, this is when paper becomes you know, really perceptibly fragile to the point of just snapping or crumbling or breaking. It'll feel really stiff, and you can sort of just break um, chunks off. So again, issues with environment cause this. Foxing um, is this is often confused with mold growth, and they they do look pretty similar. They're they are hard to tell apart, truthfully. Um, but so foxing presents as kind of these brown colored spots throughout the paper. Um, mold is usually a, a little bit more centralized. This will be sort of a throughout the paper thing. Um, it's often a result of inherent vice. Um, I told you about those uh, metal beaters that they used that deposited metal particles throughout the paper. When those oxidize, they can create um, these this um, discoloration. But uh, it, it's often really uh, made worse by high humidity and bad environmental conditions, or if uh, any of those metal particles get in touch with airborne acids or pollutants. So again, uh, you, you might not be able to totally control that one because of inherent vice, but there is some stuff you can do to avoid it a little. Um, so friable isn't really a term used to describe, you know, an issue, but it is a conservation term to describe something, um, a property of paper. So it's usually we use it to describe something that's loose and powdery. So for example, colored pigments like chalk that are not well bound to the surface of paper are friable. Some materials used to create work such as pastels and charcoal contain very little binding agent. So this means that the friable media can really separate from the paper through friction or abrasion, even just touching. Sometimes um, they may crumble easily into a powdery form. So that's just sort of something to, to be keeping in mind. Keep your eye out and, and handle appropriately. Um, this is just a fun word I like, lacuna. Um, so it's basically a hole or an area in which material has been lost. Uh, it's often caused by fr flaking, abrasion, tearing, insect attack, a puncture. Um, but I just wanted to introduce that word to you in case you might hear a conservator mention it or hear someone else mention it so you know what they're talking about. Um, so overpainting. You can sometimes only spot overpainting and inpainting using UV fluorescence with the help of a conservator. Other times it is pretty apparent. Um, and this will depend on the purpose of the overpainting. Basically, overpainting is um, where paint is applied that was not originally applied by the uh, creator. So it could have been at a later date to cover original areas for whatever reason. Um, you know, think about censorship. That, that went on maybe with nudes or something, or it could be paint from a restoration or conservation treatment. Um, Overpaint is usually used to talk about when the paint, the actual original was covered up and in painting or fill is used to talk about when something is done in a conservation treatment. Staining can occur on paper from a variety of sources. Um, there can be transfer of corrosion or rusting from the deterioration of you know, metal attachments, which you see up in the corner there, leftover from tape or um, adhesive residue caused by something else, like some kind of liquid splatter. So a stain usually just refers to any discoloration, usually a darkening, where the media or um, support layers has been penetrated. Um, this is often caused by improper housing materials. Um, it's the big culprit here. And then lastly, on my short and fast list, there's tears. Um, there are actually so many different terms for tears. I didn't even start lifting the, listing them there because um, there are so many. Scarf tears are used to describe the one that you see kind of in that first photo where it's kind of done at an angle and you have to sort of layer them just right to make them line up again. 
Um, however, you don't need to worry about the specific tear names. Those are things a conservator would worry about. For our purposes, we mostly want to think about, you know, what the cause of the tear is, how we could avoid something like that. So now that we very briefly know about some of the issues that we might be facing with paper artifacts, how can we avoid them? Well, um, as I sort of mentioned in, as we went out through, through that uh, quick list, the best way is really through proper handling and storage. Um, so right back to basics today, and we want to begin with some sort of uh, simple explanation of preservation terminology with um, an emphasis on what you might encounter when you're buying archival supplies. Hopefully you won't feel, you know, quite as pained as uh, this guy here in the photo, but it can be a confusing situation if um, you are ordering supplies, you don't know what to look, to look for, how you're going to avoid some of the damage we just talked about. As with any product, manufacturers can sometimes use terms sort of indiscriminately, so um, we'll be talking about ways to really get to know which housing materials are safe and which are not so good. So sorry to throw more kind of terminology at you. Um, I know it can be a little overwhelming, but the terms that we will be sort of covering today are acid-free, archival, buffered and non-buffered, lignin-free, uh, PAT or the photographic activity test, polyester, polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, and zeolites. So if you have questions about other terms you've come across, please feel free to ask them as we go along. We can try to try to figure it out figure them out together or um, shoot me an email later. Um, so one of kind of the most confusing terms and one of the most important ones really is the term archival. So it's everywhere. It sounds like it would be very self-explanatory. Uh, the Society of American Archivists defines archival as resistant to deterioration or loss of quality, allowing for a long life expectancy when kept in controlled conditions, not causing harm or reduced life expectancy. So, you know, that sounds totally um, understandable, makes a lot of sense, but unfortunately when it comes to preservation materials and supplies, the term archival is now nearly meaningless. The term has been overused so much in commercial advertising for preservation and art supplies that it really doesn't mean anything anymore when you see it on a product. So this is why knowing the specific manufacturing terms is ultimately more valuable than referring to something as archival or museum quality. Um, when you're looking for um, sp specific media appropriate for paper or um, storage enclosures, you're better off using those more specific terms like lignin-free or acid-free with 3% calcium carbonate reserve. Kind of the more specific, the better. You don't want to look, you don't want to have these general terms like archival. Fortunately, there are standards both American and international, which have been developed to set specific parameters for manufacturers to follow in order to advertise that they have met particular criteria. These standards, unfortunately, are all voluntary, so it means that manufacturers are not required to meet them. However, um, if they are given this designation on a package, then they have met requirements for the standards. So it's a good thing to, to look out for. Not all manufacturers will list this information, but if they do, then you know that the materials have been rigorously tested. So good thing to look out for. The term acid-free um, refers to materials that were pH at the time of production. So on the pH scale, this is approximately a pH of 7. What it does not mean is that those materials will, become, will not become acidic over time. So all it means is it was acid-free at creation. It means nothing about sort of the future of acidity. Uh, manufacturers of acid-free paper who have passed the test requirements of certain standards are able to indicate this with the circle infinity symbol that you see here. So that's a good thing to look out for. This will be found on packages um, sometimes as a watermark on paper itself. And it generally means that the paper product will be acid-free for a little while. But again, um, it doesn't really tell you what will happen in the future. So what, what should you do in the future to know if things are truly acid-free? Um, if you aren't sure whether your storage containers are currently stored in acid-free materials um, or you, know, you don't know if something has gone bad, you can um, use a pH testing pen to determine whether your current housing is or has become acidic. 
So you use the pen to just draw a small line on the housing material that you're testing, not on the object, of course, right? Um, just on the housing material. And then essentially the color of the ink will change depending on the pH of your material. So this can be a really good backup precaution for those materials that are acid-free or testing what you already have. And these pens, uh, Abby pens, A-B-B-E-Y, um, they are relatively inexpensive. You can get a bunch of them for pretty cheap. Um, so you can test all of your housing materials. Um, buffered, this is a really confusing confusing uh, wording here, buffered and unbuffered housing materials, what each term means. So I've the, this is one of the handouts, it's from the National Park Service, and I, they describe it much more eloquently than I will, but I will also describe it a little bit for you here. Um, buffered materials have an alkaline reserve, so it's usually around 2% or 3% calcium carbonate, so that is um, added during the manufacturing process. This is the buffer, so it gives the housing materials an alkaline pH. It helps to protect your paper objects from that acid migration or acidic pollutants in the environment. The alkaline reserve basically works to counteract that inherent vice that we discussed, the acid already in the paper. Um, this would will make it, the buffer will make it pH neutral. However, the alkaline reserve will be depleted over time and the housing material might become acidic in the future. So buffered materials will need to be replaced at some point still. It just kind of extends the lifetime of the housing materials. Buffered materials are great for using with most archival and library items, but of course there are a few exceptions. Um, there are some materials which can be very sensitive to the alkaline reserve and buffaline materi buffered materials. Excuse me. Um, there's been kind of a lot of debate surrounding this, but generally you want to avoid buffered materials against objects that um, have protein-based materials, for example, uh, silk, textiles, uh, some ethnographic items. Instead, you want to use non-buffered or unbuffered materials. That just means that there is no alkaline reserve, it's just pH neutral. Um, you definitely uh, want to use unbuffered storage materials for cyanotypes and blueprints because the alkalinity of the buffered materials can cause cyanotypes and blueprints to fade. So there was some debate about whether buffered enclosures can cause damage to colored prints, but recent guidelines allow for that. Um, just make sure that you are um, being mindful of what you are using these materials with. Um, this is kind of a good reference chart. It's put together by our friends at Lyricist, so it's a good way to just a quick check. Um, again, also in that download, you have there's some guidelines on that, so keep that around so that you are um, being mindful about the materials you're using. The majority of paper materials will be best stored in buffered enclosures, but if you have anything that's unusual or anything that you are unsure of, um, it's worth doing research or just storing in unbuffered if materials if you are not sure. So on to our next term. Um, we're already sort of familiar with it, lignin. We learned about that. Um, lignin is, again, that binding agent in wood that turns acidic. So ideally, you want your storage materials to um, be lignin-free, which means that they have had the lignin taken out um, and won't be acidic, or they never had lignin in the first place. So there are two main types of lignin-free Western papers that you will encounter when you are ordering supplies. These are rag paper and chemical pulp papers. Rag paper is made from cotton or other rags, not wood, so therefore it never had lignin to begin with. So if something is, is made um, from that, you will see the 100% cotton notation to indicate that it is rag paper. You know that that is a good quality paper. Chemical pulp papers um, have been chemically treated, as the name would imply, um, and so they've been they've done that to remove lignin from the wood source. Generally, chemically treated paper um, will say lignin free on the labor label, so it won't say anything about cotton or rag, um, but it'll say the lignin free. Sometimes chemical pulp papers will be manufactured to still have a very low lignin content with buffering. Um, and can still be labeled as acid-free, so make sure you're looking for the words lignin-free and, and acid-free. You want both those. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I know that we actually had a recent webinar on care of photography, so I won't go too much into this, but just for the sake of being thorough, if you're looking for housing materials that will come in contact with photographic materials, or even just the boxes that you're housing them in, you want to make sure that um, there's an indication that it's passed the photographic activity test. This was a test developed by the Image Permanence Institute that explores interaction between photographic images and the enclosures in which they're stored. Uh, the PAT is routinely used to test papers, adhesives, inks, glass, and framing components, uh, sleeving materials, labels, photo albums, all that stuff. Um, so you want to look for past PAT on, on it to make sure it is an appropriate housing material for photographs. Okay, next up is our plastics. Um, there are many types of clear plastic enclosures, and to be honest, they all sort of look the same um, to the naked eye. So it's important to know, you know, just what material it is that you are getting. Um, you know, that's why you can't always just go to the uh, office store and buy the clear plastic sleeves, right? You need to actually order the, the truly um, preservation grade materials. So to ensure that you're using good, stable quality enclosures that won't harm your paper collections, you want to look for the three P's, polyester, polyethylene, or polypropylene. The fourth P that we see a lot is polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, and it is not stable to use with archival collection. So do not use PVC. Um, lastly, and most scientifically, are zeolites. Zeolites are um, molecular set sieves, which in kind of the most basic terms, they kind of trap environmental pollutants or pollutants which might be released by the objects itself, such as, um, you know, some of the acids we've been talking about. Zeolites are sometimes combined with calcium carbonate to create a paper product that is both alkaline and have these little traps. So papers with the molecular traps do have a finite lifespan. The, the traps become full eventually. Um, but this varies by manufacturer and the environment they're in. So um, each manufacturer should be able to provide kind of general information about the lifespan of the enclosure with zeolites or molecular traps. Um, but these can be super helpful if you have something that just has a lot of inherent vice or you know it's going to be in a not so great uh, environment. So quick review of what we just covered. Also, some of this is reiterated in the housing guidelines that are up there in the, the files download, so make sure that you check that out. Basically, as I said in the beginning, you want to know what you are buying, look for specific terms instead of general terms in the product um, descriptions, and um, of course choose kind of the most stable non-reactive materials out there and available. And remember, even when you are buying kind of the best products out there, if the materials are not stored in a proper environment, even if they are, sometimes they will go bad over time. So it is super important to regularly be checking on your artifacts and materials to make sure everything is, is holding up. Science um, is, is, you know, changes over time. So we want to make sure that we have the best, most up-to-date materials. Um, the overall environmental conditions um, under which paper materials are um, stored and displayed can have a great effect upon their, lo upon their longevity. Factors that lead to damage can include pollution, pests, inappropriate temperatures, relative humidity, and light. So when we think about environmental monitoring and environmental conditions, we often think of temperature and humidity first. And yes, this is super important. We will go there. Um, but I wanted to start a little bit off the beaten path. Um, I could talk about environment forever, but I'm going to keep it brief for us today. And let's start with pollutants. Um, you often see fading of dyes and pigments. The overall degradation of paper can be caused by a variety of pollutants, um, sulfuric acid, nitric um, acid, ozone, formaldehyde. These chemicals can originate from either kind of the outside air or from materials in the object, inherent vice. Um, wood and leather, as well as some rubber and plastic materials can produce acid vapors as they age, can cause all sorts of problems. Um, so air filtration is one of the most effective ways to minimize damage due to pollution, though I've listed some other mitigation strategies on this slide as well. Proper storage can help to prolong the life of works on paper if air filtration is not feasible. You can use supplies like the zeolites, right, with the little traps, as we just discussed, for example. 
and keeping things in enclosures in general as opposed to just out and open on a shelf will help as well to protect from particles that might kind of just be floating around in the air those accretions right dirt and dust that is that are in the air so um, there are there are things you can do to avoid if air filtration is impossible but that is definitely the best way to go about it um, there are a variety of insects, right, that can damage paper. They have to do with the environment. I've listed kind of a couple of the biggest offenders here on the slide. We actually have done a whole webinar on pests, so I don't want to go too far in, in detail with this one. But in general, um, good housekeeping is the best method of deterrence with pests. Regular inspection of stored collections provides kind of the cheapest and safest method to safeguarding um, our collections against infestation. Screening on windows and doors will aid in keeping out larger pests. In addition, fresh flowers and plants should be inspected before being brought into the building. You should monitor with sticky insect traps, which you see a picture of there. Um, those can be placed in storage. These traps do not poison insects, but they do aid in assessing the number and types of insects that might be present. Many insects, like the book louse, for example, are too small to see with the naked eye, so you'll need to investigate closer with the use of a sticky trap. Um, in general, insecticides should not be used in um, or around uh, archival materials. Insecticides can cause fading discoloration, add all sorts of pollutants into the air, as we just discussed in the last slide. So if you do find an infestation, you want to place it in a sealed plastic bag and then contact a professional immediately to determine what the next steps might be. Of course, here's the biggie. I told you we would get back around to it. Um, temperature and humidity. If the temperature in your institution is too high, it can cause rapid decay, speeding up chemical processes that are already occurring, basically enhancing that inherent vice. Um, the shortening of lifespan and collections in general will, will happen with higher temperatures. Generally, low temperatures are not always such an issue. Low temperature storage is actually ideal for certain materials like film and photographs. Um, so you want to aim towards low if, if you can. Um, high humidity, especially when accompanied by elevated temperatures, can encourage pest infestations, swelling of organic materials, corrosion of metals, all sorts of problems. In high heat and high humidity, mold growth is more likely. Inactive molds can quickly become active with the right combination of temperature and humidity. High RH, like high humidity, often speeds up chemical reactions again, um, especially if those reactions require water. Paper and parchment will, will cockle. Remember that wavy deformation at high levels. They can also buckle, as, as we talked about before. Watercolors could, can bleed on paper. Um, if humidity is too low, it will cause a variety of problems um, as well. Kind of shrinking, stiffening, cracking, flaking is possible with those low temperatures. Papers and adhesives can often become dried out. And papers that are chemically unstable, like acidic papers, uh, can gradually disintegrate and discolor with prolonged exposure to low relative humidity. So for both temperature and relative humidity, fluctuations are actually kind of more hazardous than um, extremes on either end. The risks on, of, of the extremes are always present, but the, the constant changes are often more concern. Change, changes changes um, in the moisture content of materials kind of cause the, the materials to expand and contract, and these actions create internal stress um, with that constant shifting, shifting and really accelerates all the, all the problems we've just been talking about um, and really will hasten that deterioration. So it's best to keep things as stable as possible. Um, even if you're lingering a little bit towards one of the extremes, it's better to keep it stable than to have those big swings because those swings will just exaggerate the problems. So new research indicates some flexibility in the ranges of temperature and humidity levels over time. Um, as long as there's you know, not extended periods of huge extremes. But careful environmental monitoring and data analysis is the only way to really um, make sure that you are doing this. So it's very important to be monitoring using data loggers, like you see there. That's a picture of a data logger. And here are sort of the general guidelines that are, are right now the sort of best practice. Um, like I said, it's OK to kind of linger near one of those extremes as long as it's staying um, consistent. Um, 
and of, again, making sure that you are tracking so that you know what is going on when. The other biggie here is light. Um, when we think of light damage, we often think of fading. Fading is really only the most recognizable form of damage. Aside from fading, there may be uh, damage to the physical and chemical structure as well. Light and UV radiation provides energy to fuel the chemical reactions that lead to deterioration. Um, again, they increase inherent vice. Um, UV is often blamed for most damage, and it's kind of the one we talk about a lot, but visible light is also very problematic. Intensity and long exposure times to visible light can lead to fading or changing colors and dyes and colorants. UV radiation will lead to all this as well, as well as weakening, bleaching, yellowing of paper and other organic materials, but they both are bad. Um, light is really one of the most destructive agents because it's, it's um, effects cannot be reversed. So when something is faded, it will be faded forever. Um, light damage is also cumulative, so um, it happens over an extended period of time. Every little bit counts. You have to be very mindful of the total amount of light exposure that an object receives in its whole entire lifetime, not just, um, you know, when the institution is open or when it's, you know, on exhibit just for these six months. It, it's gonna, if it comes right back on exhibit, that'll, that'll be a problem. So in general, organic materials are a little bit uh, more affected by light exposure. Uh, guess what? Paper is probably one of the most sensitive materials. Textiles is a close second, but definitely those both are up there. So the measures you can take um, to prevent this are using things like blinds and curtains liberally, you know, make sure, making sure that you're turning all those lights off, which will also save on electricity costs, so that's a good one. Um, and then installing UV filtering film on windows and light bulbs as you see um, one of my coworkers doing here. Light levels should also be meticulously tracked for materials on display. But while materials are in storage, they should be contained in enclosures that will block all light exposure. Um, and you want to make sure all of your storage areas are generally dark, right? Um, and that leads me to, to my next topic, collection storage. So we've already talked about how to select the most appropriate materials and the importance of controlling the environment. But now let's talk about a little bit about how to arrange and care for collections while they are tucked away in storage. Many of the condition issues that we discussed um, in the beginning of this can be prevented through proper storage. So um, first things first, before you begin any kind of rehousing, reorganizing, or storage initiative, you want to make sure that you are as organized as possible. You'll want to be prepared to label things correctly, house materials correctly, remove some of the hazards that you might be coming across while you are processing. Keys to proper labeling include uh, generally what I've listed here. You want to make sure that you are, uh, whatever you're doing is reversible and as clear as possible, making sure you're using your very nicest penmanship. Um, pencils are key, you can label everything. Um, you don't want pieces to get sort of separated or lost. So if you have you know, a piece of paper that's ripped and, and they're both part of the same artifact, make sure that you are labeling both of those pieces very clearly um, as, you know, part A, part B, making sure that there's no way they can get separated from each other. Or if they are, you can reunite them easily. Um, I'm not going to go too much into storage furniture, but there are a few basic principles that you should aim to follow. I've included the shelving guidelines handout up in the, the corner there for you to take a closer look at when you're thinking about shelving options. So make sure you download that. Um, but just sort of your general guidelines, you want to make sure that shelving is wide enough to support the material stored on it. Metal shelving is really best, but it is possible to use alternatives if you're just being mindful about it. Flat files should be used to store oversized maps, files, and art on paper. Paper enclosures uh, come in a variety of styles and configurations. You can purchase enclosures or you can make your own using acid-free, lignin-free, buffered or unbuffered, depending on the material, um, paper, and uh, creating small folders or envelopes. These are versatile, usually very cheap, and a good option for almost all paper materials. Plastic enclosures are also, um, you know, very helpful, function in much the same way. They're usually more ex expensive, and um, but they are particularly good if you want to keep an item protected but still want to be able to see the contents. 
So um, that, that they can be really helpful. These are often sold as archival polyester under trade names like Mylar or if you're in Europe, Melanex. Um, just remember what we learned about our three Ps, right? Um, one concern to think about with plastic enclosures is they often have um, an elect electrostatic charge and this can be really great for holding materials in so that they don't kind of slip out of the sleeve but it can also be problematic if you have any of those condition issues like flaking, friable media, any sort of sensitive materials. Um, so sometimes it's better to use a paper enclosure if you are not sure. Um, these are sold uh, as pre-made folders which can be sealed on uh, two or three sides. I like the kinds where they're just sealed on two sides. That's called an L sleeve. It makes it easier to retrieve the item if necessary without kind of dragging it. You can unfold it a little bit more. You can also buy rolls or sheets of the materials and fold them yourselves. You can seal them using an um, ultrasonic welder if you're very fancy. Um, you never want to fully encapsulate something because you can, you know, inadvertently create an undesirable microclimate. So you want to make sure you're getting that air circulation in there. And that kind of brings me to another point is you never want to um, be using a tape to seal these either. You, you only want to use um, an ultrasonic welder if you are if you are putting those two together. The adhesive from double-sided taste tape, excuse me, will most likely migrate to the inside of an enclosure over time, causing the object to become sticky and making it difficult to remove, plus exposing it to many potentially harmful byproducts in the adhesive. Um, so just tape is never a good idea ever, basically. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of tapes out there that are advertised as being archival or conservation friendly or reversible, something like that. Um, I don't care if it's on sale at Gaylord or University Products, anything like that. If it is tape, it is not archival. Tape is evil. So no tape. That's the one thing we take away from this webinar. Um, off of my, my uh, soapbox, <laughs> I'll get, get on to uh, in my next product here. I get a lot of questions about glassine. Um, it is you know, fairly inexpensive. A lot of archives and museums used to use it in the past. I myself have made glassine folders for our artifacts in a previous life. However, as you can sort of see from this photo, um, glassine ages and becomes very acidic and brittle. It can have super sharp edges to the glass part of glassine. It can be very sharp, which can cause a lot of um, scratches and, and issues. So it is generally not recommended for use in collections anymore. So this is a good example also of what was best practices, you know, 10 or so years ago is not anymore. So, so you want to make sure that you are keeping up to date on this information. So once you have foldered or sleeved your items, um, you also should use storage boxes. And there are so many varieties of storage boxes. And it comes to choosing um, you know, vertical versus horizontal. It can often be a matter of preference and what is kind of easier to use. If you have collections that are stored in files and that are used often, a vertical storage box makes it a lot easier to access the materials without having to remove everything in the box. A horizontal box, in contrast, is, is often better for, you know, things that are grouped together or works of art often are stored that way. Um, one thing to look out for when you're using the vertical boxes is that you don't overfill them. Um, but of course you don't want to underfill them as well because then the materials will sort of slump on themselves. So to avoid this, you can use a spacer to fill up extra space, ensure that those materials stay vertical. Um, if the box starts to fill up, you can remove the spacer, easy peasy. Um, so you can either buy a spacer or you can make one yourself. You, you can see some examples of that here. If you have materials of different sizes in the same box, um, you can sometimes end up with different areas of pressure. For example, a long folder might start kind of keeling over a smaller one. So you can put these spacers or pieces of, of rigid board um, in between for support. Um, so that you can have both large and small objects in the same box, which can be handy for saving space. Um, this is an example of sto vertical storage gone wrong, right? You can see how the photographs have become curled and distorted as a result of being stored vertically without any support or spacers. So definitely want to avoid that. 
For horizontal storage, the drop front box is, is super handy. It allows you to lift objects out with um, enough space so that you're not kind of jamming your fingers in there, gouging edges, trying to slip your fingers in between things. This drop front box can really help with that. Boxes without the drop front, here you see an example um, of a uh, not having a drop front box. Um, makes it really difficult and, and less safe for the artifacts. This person has to sort of manhandle the artifacts to shift through the box to see what she's looking for. So um, keep that in mind with your uh, box selection. Here's an example, again, of what you don't want to see in a storage box. The person who housed these objects obviously had really good intentions, was on the right track. Uh, however, there's a few issues here. Appropriate boxes are available in standard sizes that match the standard sizes of many objects. Objects of similar size should be stored together unless you do something like I talked about with that vertical storage box. Um, they shouldn't just be stacked on each other like, like you see here. Um, you want to kind of choose your boxes, especially if you're doing the horizontal storage for you know the, the size to, to fit snugly with your materials. This box is too large for the materials that you see here. The variety, varied size of materials means that they're going to slide around, they're going to bump into each other, they'll most likely cause damage to each other. Um, mats are a really handy way to protect um, artifacts in storage. Sometimes they can be helpful to mount objects even if they're not going immediately on exhibition because you can use it to have protection in storage and then it's, it's good to to use later if you do end up exhibiting them. Um, you can mat match things so that they're all the same size and then you can stack them easily in a, in a um, box to avoid the situation we just saw. Um, so the object, if you are matting something, should be attached to the back mat with Japanese paper hinges. Never ever tape, right? Um, you also don't want to be dry mounting anything to a mat because that puts heat and pressure on the objects and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to remove. When storing matted materials, always place a sheet of interleaving or tissue um, between the mats to protect the um, object from abrading against the mat. So, very handy method. Um, there are lots of different options for interleaving. Uh, there's different thicknesses of paper, tissue. They often come buffered, unbuffered. Those things we talked about, you can get individual sheets or rolls. Um, so whatever works best for you is fine as long as you are checking all those materials. Uh, Microchamber interleaving papers are manufactured with those um, zeolites that we talked about. Um, so those can be super helpful if you want to look out for that, that word. Um, they are, you know, more expensive than the traditional buffered or unbuffered materials, but really excellent product and might be very helpful. For photographic materials, the safest choice is silver safe paper or phototex paper. Those are 100% cotton and unbuffered. They are designed specifically to be housed with photographic material. So make sure if you are um, doing photos, it's a different system than just regular paper. So now that we know how to house our paper collections in proper materials and proper environments, let's talk about how to handle them properly. Um, so, even if you kind of know how to handle things already, I'm still going to go over the basics. There are kind of six aspects to handling paper materials, which we will discuss today. First things first, you want to wash your hands. Um, always be prepared. The next step is to think about whether or not you need to wear gloves. There is the myth that people who work with historic documents or in museums, archives, are always gloved up in those white cotton gloves you see on TV. But there are times when wearing cotton gloves, especially, can cause more harm than good. Generally speaking, when you do wear gloves, you should wear nitrile, not cotton. Um, nitrile gloves are chemically stable, they do not leave residue on materials, and they allow for a firmer grip on materials. Um, as long as your hands are clean and dry, often just using your hands is preferable to using gloves when you're dealing with paper. Uh, gloves can snare, um, tear fragile pieces, um, so it can ma often make it a little bit more difficult. So in, in the case of paper, uh, clean, dry hands are usually fine um, when you're handling paper. You uh, 
don't you de definitely do need to wear gloves if you are handling photographic materials so um, keep that in mind as well it is preferable to wear nitrile gloves so that you avoid the transfer of the oils from your hands to the emulsion layer Um, another part, oh, I went ahead. I just wanted to look at the puppy dog picture. But another part of being uh, prepared is making sure that you're dressed properly. If you have long hair, it's best to tie it up so your hair doesn't kind of fall forward onto the archival materials. It also keeps your hair from, you know, accidentally brushing against something fragile, knocking off something that's flaking. Similarly, you don't want to be, uh, you know, having dangly necklaces or anything like a lanyard that might have your ID pass on it. Um, jewelry is a, is a big no, 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 especially rings, bracelets, watches. Um, basically, you want to remove anything that might catch on, on your paper artifacts. If you're handling a large amount of dirty or dusty material, it's a good idea to have an apron or lab coat. This keeps uh, the dirt from leaving with you and going on to clean parts of, of the museum or archive or to your home. Similarly, it can protect any materials you're handling from any grime and dirt that you might bring on your street clothes. Um, nail polish, particularly colored nail polish, is a big no-no when handling um, objects, especially um, especially paper, which you often do with bare hands. Brightly colored nail polish can really easily transfer to a uh, surface of a paper, even if it's fully cured. I used to work with an in at an institution where one of the curators wore bright red nail polish, so there were tons of mats and sink mats around that looked like they just had red color marks on them, and that was actually from the nail polish, so if you have to have a manicure, then you have to wear gloves, um, but ideally, you just wouldn't. So on to our retriever here. Um, when you're retrieving materials from something, say like a flat file, you want to um, remove the folios from drawers one at a time. If the folio is at a bottom of the drawer or the bottom of, you know, a stack of box, then make sure you have a clear, clean landing space to put to stack things until you reach the item you're looking for, removing things one by one. I know it can seem super tedious, but it's you're much better off. Slow and steady wins the race with that one. Um, large materials such as maps or heavy folders, you uh, probably need two pairs of hands to remove them. If a drawer or shelf is higher than shoulder level and one person needs to use a ladder or stool, then at least two pairs of hands will um, be needed to assist with removing the object. And remember, move slowly, right? The more slower, more deliberately you move, the better off you will be. Um, which is also a good thing to do when you're actually transporting the objects as well. The transport we are talking about here is very minimal. Um, today, uh, we're talking about just going from one side of a building to another, not major art shipping. So that is my caveat here. Um, however, some of the same basic principles uh, are the same. It's important to have a plan what you're doing, no matter how basic, before you move any sort of artifact. Um, it's also important that you feel comfortable asking for help if you need it. Just take a couple of minutes, make a plan about what you're doing, where you're going, what your route is. Um, here in my office, we always use carts to transport materials. You see a picture here actually from my office with one of my coworkers. Um, always make sure that wherever, um, whatever cart you choose is large enough to safely support the objects that you're transporting. Move slowly, be aware of your surroundings and your body movement. Most of the time, transporting paper materials should be fairly simple, but in cases where you're undertaking kind of a more extensive move, these are just some things to to think about. While transporting and handling your materials, it's important to be providing support. That's kind of the number one thing here. First rule of support, you never want your materials to be floppy, right? Whenever possible, use a rigid material such as a piece of acid-free board or folder with a rigid base to support the materials. Um, the rigid support should be a few inches larger than the object on all sides. Um, so you can uh, see a good example of, of that on the top photo there. Um, it has plenty of room on all sides of it. If you're moving individual sheets of paper over a short distance, say you're moving it from one side of your desk to another, you can use a uh, flexible support, as you see in the bottom photo here. Um, you can kind of make a, pick up the, op the corners opposite and very gently kind of maintaining some tension. You can sort of make a little hammock for your, for your artifact to lay in. Um, you don't want to crunch it, right, but you don't want to be too lax and loose also. Um, a good sort of hammock material is, uh, you know, interleaving paper that we talked about before 
or maybe a non-woven woven polyester tissue paper, those can all be used to, to make this sort of um, hammock. Before you handle an artifact, uh, you want to inspect it. You are basically looking for anything that might make the object unsafe to handle. Um, it's also kind of a good time to quickly analyze the condition of the object for future reference. Um, all those conditions that we talked about might affect how you are going to be handling it, how you are going to be housing it. So you want to have all of this um, in mind well before you even get started on your project. Lastly, make sure you're using good handling techniques in general. There are some tricks that you will want to know when you're handling objects in order to provide the maximum amount of support for the object and to reduce potential damage during handling or movement. I've put some tips up on the screen here. Basically, if you are unsure, don't handle, right? Ask someone who is more experienced than you for help and make sure that all um, appropriate staff feel comfortable handling artifacts that probably will include doing some training every once in a while. Um, if, you, if you are unsure, make sure you are calling someone to ask. Um, you can always call us here at CCAHA. We will help you out. Um, or you might have some other coworkers in the area who might be able to help you out as well. And then finally, to make sure all of this is happening, it's super essential to have um, established a handling policy for your institution. So this document can be really simple to draw up. Having a handling policy um, you know, not only protects the collection, but it also will protect the visitors, researchers, if you have them at the institution. Um, and just in general, make sure that all of your artifacts are being cared for properly. A good handling policy should cover the following, um, you know, shielding artifacts from UV light, identifying artifacts um, with signage and covering them up if they are left out overnight, restricting food, drink, or live plants in collections area, uh, banning materials that might cause harm. That can include inks, rubber bands, staples, clips, tapes, all, all of that, post-its, sticky notes, those are all bad. Um, and very important, the policy should cover instructing and insist, uh, assisting researchers um, or interns, new employees, in the correct procedures for handling. So as you can see, this document can help with a lot of the aspects that we have discussed today in um, caring for collections. So a lot of this planning policy establishment can really go a long way in making sure that your paper artifacts are cared for well. All right, so we have made it to the end of the webinar on um, caring for paper. Does anybody have any questions about any of the material we covered? Please feel free to type them over in the chat box. All right, I'm not seeing anybody typing over there, so please make sure that you download the files up in the Files 2 box. You just highlight them, click Upload File, and then you will get a copy of it. Um, we're also recording this webinar. It will be available on the website, so you are able to go back and check it out if I missed, so, or if you missed something or you want to just go back and, and re-listen to it. So thank you again, everyone, and um, we will see you at the end of next month. We're going to be doing a Caring for Objects um, webinar then. So please uh, keep your eyes peeled to email to get more information there.